today is the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. Um, and we're going to hear that in our, when we have our prayers a little bit later. And, and what that is, is once a year taking time specifically to remember in our prayers those people who live in places where it is against the law to be a Christian. Or even in, in some countries where the government has said it's legal to be a Christian and we want to protect you, the culture is so turned against Christianity uh, that the government is, is ineffective in protecting Christians. Uh, and, and so we remember those places. And, and we get a taste of that in, in what I'm about to read here in this passage from 2 Kings with the healing of Naaman, where we see an Israelite girl who is a slave uh, of, of, these, of Naaman's wife. Uh, so... Uh, just remember and, and keep that in mind on the struggles that we face as Christians. The king of Aram had great admiration for Naaman, the commander of his army, because through him the Lord had given Aram great victories. But though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy. At this time, Aramean raiders had invaded the land of Israel, and among their captives was a young girl who had been given to Naaman's wife as a maid. One day the girl said to her mistress, I wish my master would go and see the prophet in Samaria. He would heal him of his leprosy. So Naaman told the king what the young girl from Israel had said. Go and visit the prophet, the king of Aram told him. I will send a letter of introduction for you to take to the king of Israel. So Naaman started out carrying his gifts, 700 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter to the king of Israel said, with this letter, I present my servant Naaman. I want you to heal him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes in dismay and said, This man sends me a leper to heal. Am I God that I can give life and take it away? I can see that he's just trying to pick a fight with me. But when Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes in dismay, he sent this message to him. Why are you so upset? Send Naaman to me, and he will learn that there is a true prophet here in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and waited at the door of Elijah's house. But Elisha sent a messenger out to him with this message, Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored, and you will be healed of your leprosy. But Naaman became angry and stalked away. I thought he would certainly come out and meet me, he said. I expected him to wave his hands over the leprosy and call on the name of the Lord as God and heal me. Aren't the rivers of Damascus, the Abana, and the Farpar better than any of the rivers of Israel? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? So Naaman turned and went away in a rage. But his officers tried to reason with him and said, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? So you should certainly obey him when he says simply go and wash and be cured. So Naaman went down to the Jordan River and dipped himself seven times as the man of God had instructed him. And his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child. And he was healed. Um, while I was gone um, on some military training, you might remember Julie preached on this same passage. And I had already picked this and was talking to her this week. In fact, I had my sermon all done when she said, Oh yeah, I preached on that. I get really nervous because then that gives you an opportunity to care, compare me to Julie. And as Nelson points out often, you know, I might not like the, like the outcome of that comparison. <laughs> um, but, but Julie told me she also preached on this over in Otumbo recently. And, and um, she said there, I think what she also said here, she said, Naaman almost died. And do you remember what she said he almost died of? Pride. Almost died of pride. Because here he is, the general of the army, and we got a lot of veterans here. You know how much the, army, the military loves pomp and circumstance. And he goes up to the door. What's he do? He sends his, his helper out there. He sends his, his, what we would say these days, his personal assistant to deal with him. And, and he's upset. 
and he's going to and he's going to leave and and his his uh, other officers and workers with him say it's an easy thing why not do this easy thing why you know if he had asked you to do something really difficult you would do it but he asked you to do something really simple why are you just go do it and so he did it he swallowed his pride uh, and he did it now very quickly on there's some Things on the background you need to know here. Here's a map. Um, Aram, way up in the north. During the time of King David, Aram was part of Israel. The, the people of Aram were not those who left Egypt. They were people that were conquered by David. It was part of Israel. But after David was gone, dead and gone, Aram rebelled against Israel, became their own country, and... Um, became a real thorn in the side of Israel. And when this takes place now, the nation, the kingdom of Israel is broken into two. So you have the kingdom of Judea headquartered in, uh, with its capital in Jerusalem in the south. But this all takes place in the north. Remember she, he said, so they'll know their, the, the servants said, go to Samaria, meaning the city of Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel, it's very confusing because the south is Judah with Jerusalem. We think of Israel, but the north is Israel with Samaria. We think the Samaria, if you know your Bible, it gets very confusing. We're mixing up all these different places. But anyway, uh, he is Samaria, the capital there towards the bottom of the page. That's, that's up. And you see the Sea of Galilee there. This all takes place right around the area where Jesus did all his ministry. And not long before this, Aram and Israel had been at open war. They were always at, um, well, it talks about there was raiders coming across. And the picture I get in my mind is uh, the nation of Israel, the kingdom of Israel and, and Aram, they're fighting each other. The war ends, but these raiders from Aram keep coming across and, and having raiding parties and stealing things and kidnapping people. And the people in Israel are like scratching their heads saying, I thought the war was over. Because they're not, the, the, the Aramean, Arameans are a warlike people. The Israelites are not. So when the war was over, they all go home. They go back to their stores and their shops and their farms, and they think that's it. But the Arameans keep fighting. And, um, and so they're not friends. They're not allies. They're enemies. And in fact, you could say they're the worst kind of enemies because they're related enemies. And you know how it is. You know, that's how it is. They're related enemies, and so they really hate each other. Um, eventually, the Arameans would form with other uh, tribes and cultures up in the north there in what is today Syria, and they would form the, na the kingdom, the empire of Assyria, and they would conquer and destroy the city of Samaria and the northern kingdom of Israel, destroy them to be no more. Uh, so these are not their friends. So now we have this, used to be part of Israel, now they're enemies. So the, the king of Aram is sending his commanding general to an enemy country to be healed. It's, it's, this is not a normal thing. This is an extraordinary thing. Um, another thing... When he goes there, Elisha lives away from the king because the king doesn't like Elisha. The, the primary job of the prophets, and this is one we miss in our modern context because the primary job of the prophets doesn't exist anymore. In ancient Israel, the primary job of the prophets was call, to call the king back to Israel. Everything the prophets said was, was directed at the kings. Even if it was directed at the people, it was directed as the king as the leader of the people, saying, Come back to God or else this is going to happen. That's the prophet, that's their job. That's the job title. Call the king back to God so the king can lead the people in God's presence. So Elijah keeps going to the king and saying, you're doing this wrong and you're doing that wrong and you're doing that wrong. And finally the king had enough of it and Elijah was treated poorly to say the least. And so he moved away. He lives in a whole other part of the country. Um... And so Naaman goes to the wrong place. The, the more I read this story and the more I think about it, the more parallels I see 
with another story in the Bible, in the New Testament, of some foreign dignitaries going to the king and asking the king for something and the king becoming very upset. I'm thinking of the Magi. They come to Jerusalem looking for the new king. And of course, there's already a king, Herod. And he says, what do you mean the new king? And he gets very upset. Um, we have Naaman coming to the king saying, heal me. And the king's like, are you kidding? I'm not God. I don't have the power. I don't have that kind of power to heal you. So we have all these factors coming in. They're enemy countries that that the person who's supposed to keep the king in line has been driven away, so he can't be there to keep the king in line. And so, Naaman goes to the wrong place. And what starts out as a simple comment, and doesn't this happen also often, a simple comment by that little girl who's, who's a handmaid to, the, to Naaman's wife, a simple comment, there's a guy in Samaria who could heal your husband. That's it. And it's blown up now to an international incident that is on the verge of war. Because that's what the king says. He's just looked because that's what the king of Aram used to do. In fact, one time, the king of Aram sent a letter when Ahab was king, and he said, I'm going to invade your country unless you send me all your gold and all your silver and all your daughters. That, that's... That's the ultimatum. You know what Ahab did? He sent all his gold, all his silver, and all his daughters. Because he didn't think he could win a war. Because he didn't trust God. Um, and, and so, this is, the, this is the history. This happened, that happened before. The, that's the history between these two nations. It's a history of mistrust and war. And so he comes with this letter, turning what should have been a very simple process of one person going to another person and being healed, it ends up being one government dignitary going to another government dignitary and we're on the verge of war. I tell you, when I was writing this sermon, it was hard not to think about the election. <laughs> Just, and politicians and the government. It was very hard. Um, so, here we go. Ironically, while Elijah was rejected by the authorities of Israel, he sought out by a foreigner. The parallels with the New Testament just do not stop here. With how Jesus was rejected, with, with Dennis read that, it starts out so good. Jesus says these things, the people say, oh, this is wonderful, he says such wonderful things. And then Jesus says, and I'm the one. Then they hate him, and they want to kill him. The authorities in Israel rejected Jesus and they wanted to kill him because his vision of what God's kingdom looked like and their vision of what God's kingdom looked like were at odds. They could not coexist. And so Elijah is rejected by the authorities of Israel because he speaks the word of God. And yet a foreigner comes to seek him out because he has healing power. And, and something interesting happens then. Naaman becomes a witness to the king of Israel. Now think of this. If the king of Israel and Naaman ever met again, and the king of Israel saw him when he was all sick with leprosy, and then he would see him healthy with this, not just, not just healthy, but the skin of a child. Man, what adult wouldn't want that? The skin of a child. Every time the king of Israel would see Naaman, he'd be reminded, Elijah did something I can't do. Eli because Elijah has the power of God. And Elijah is a man of God. And I'm not. He'd be reminded. And so, ironically, this foreigner, who most of his life is waging war against Israel, becomes a witness of the power of God and the power of change physically, literally change to the king of Israel who's rejected God's messenger. Now here's, here's something quite interesting. You may have noticed. The king is unnamed. The king is never named. 
because I believe this story was, was kept in the annals. It was kept alive as a, um, a warning to all future kings. This is your role as the king. This is Elijah's role as God's prophet. Don't ever think that your job is more important than his job. He does things that you can't do. So the best thing that you can do, all you kings, is to listen to him. Some did, some didn't. Too many didn't. But it, so, so, this, so not only does Naaman become a witness, of the, this foreigner becomes a witness to the power of God, but this story then becomes a reminder to future kings, this is what it's all about. And, and I started thinking about this passage, and I started thinking about um, the lesson of this foreigner coming in and being healed, and of the simple thing he was told to do. It was nothing complicated. It was nothing fancy. Just go in the river. Go dip in the river seven times, and you'll be healed. Um, and I started thinking about um, worship in the bigger context of what worship looks like. And so that led me to start digging into the gospel stories to look very specifically at what Jesus says about worship and what worship looks like. Um, and I found something that really surprised me. I found in all four gospels, only once ever does Jesus say anything positive about worship. Every other time Jesus mentions worship, worship, it's negative. Their worship is a farce. Their hearts are far from me. All that kind of, that's all he has to say about worship. It's all negative. It's all, you do it, you people worship me all wrong. Except for one time, when he was in, not Israel, but Samaria, up in the north, talking to a woman at the well, who, in my mind, is a waitress at a truck stop. That's just how I visualize her. Kind of the, you know, the attitude, snapping her gum, pineapple earrings. No nonsense. She's seen a lot. She can see through, you know, pretenders. And she meets Jesus and she realizes he's, he's the real thing. And so she asks him a question. She says, how come... We Samaritans live up, worship here up on the mountain, and you Jews worship in Jerusalem. Who's right? Which is the right way to worship? Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter. Remember that. It will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship while we Jews know all about him. For salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now. Just like we heard what Dennis said, this prophecy has been fulfilled now. He said it's here now when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. This is the only positive mention I could find in the Gospels that Jesus makes of worship. And yet, Lutherans are a little behind the time, so it took us till about the 80s. A lot of churches had it in the 70s. They're, they call it the worship wars. How to do worship service. You got to do it this way. You got to do it that way. Jesus says, no. I'm telling you, Jesus could care less of the form of our worship. He could care less. What he cares about is we worship in spirit and truth. And what he's talking about there is our whole lives. Our whole lives are lives of worship. He says, how do we worship? He says, what does he say he's going to do? We heard the reading. What? The captives are free. The sick are healed. The, the captive, the, um, the oppressed are given good news and released. All these things he says. And he says, I do these. These are the things that I'm doing. 
It says that's true worship. True worship has very little to do with uh, do we sing hymns or do we sing contemporary songs? Do we have a band or a giant pipe organ? All of those can be true worship. Can be true worship whether you whether the pastors wear investments or a golf shirt or a t-shirt. Because Jesus says true worship is worship of the heart. It's the worship of the life. Um, Paul, picking up on what Jesus taught one time, and this is, this is kind of his conclusion to the book of Romans. He wrote, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Jesus gave his body for you. Now you give your body for God. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. The, um, I, I think sometimes in America it's easy for us to get caught up in kind of the, the minutiae and the details and forget the big picture. You know, we confuse the forest and the trees sometimes. The, the persecuted church, the church where Christians suffer, they understand. It's not you go to church on Sunday morning and then you live whatever the rest of the week. For them, every moment is a reminder of their faith because every moment they are in danger of losing their jobs, losing their families, being put in jail, losing their freedom, or even losing their life. Uh, and sometimes in America, we just, we just get a little distracted, I think it may be the best way to put it. But what Paul is saying here, echoing Jesus, he's saying, what, what is an acceptable worship is us, the sacrifice of ourselves, the giving of ourselves, and specifically, the giving of ourselves in service to others. That's what, that's what uh, Paul is talking about when Paul says that Christ gave himself for you, literally died on the cross for us. Now it is our time to give ourselves to Christ, but we can't, with dying on the cross doesn't do anything for Christ. He's talking about doing it and giving ourselves to others, in service to others, in a response to what Christ has done for us. Um, and so it is, it is my prayer for this church and for all of us gathered today and, and for all Christians is that is who we would be. That we would really be people that, that um, when people look at Fairfield, they would say Fairfield is a better place because those Christians are here. That, that Fairfield is a better place because those Christians are here giving themselves to us. So let's pray for that. Father in heaven, we give you thanks for so many things today. And, and chief among them is that Jesus gave himself for us on the cross. So that we could be reconciled with you. And we pray, Lord, now that you would help us and guide us. Give us insights and give us strength. So that we can give ourselves and in service to you through being in service to others. We pray for this guidance uh, and these insights in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.